you hear that? Ch -ch that was the dwarf mongers going wild dog and the impala didn't even stop. Fortunately they are running parallel to the road. That wasn't a very serious attempt, those darn dwarf mongers. Now, the amazing thing is now we've followed lion and leopard and everything and as soon as an impala sees them, they snort. With a wild dog, they don't. They just run. Uh, Elizabeth says, what a wonderful first day back for you, Brent. Indeedy, Elizabeth. Uh, great to be back uh, with Safari Live and great to be back in the bush and great to be with the African wild dogs and, of course, the killer bees. So, so far, and it is not always the case, but the female seems to be leading the hunts at the moment. Uh, it also just depends on who's the most hungry. But the best news is, uh, she, well, the pack is moving deeper into Juma. Now, this could be really fun coming up. We've got some zebra. Zebra will often ch chase wild dogs. Uh, big adult zebra. There's a zebra in the road. Uh, not really a threat to the dogs. They might try to avoid the zebra. This. Oh, these zebras are these are these are chicken zebras. Off they run. That's unusual. I uh, wonder where the stallion is. Zebra stallions normally chase wild dogs. Here they are. The dogs about to jog into view. They're going deeper and deeper into Juma. Isn't that the best news? I just need an update on the radio. Stations, uh, Mashoa are still mobile, northeast down Philemon's uh, cut line. Oh, the zebras are going to chase them. There we go. Yeah, I filmed that chest. If uh, just come on to Philemon's, they're heading towards Shabam Junction. Okay, so just leaving Ephraim know where we are. Those zebras might try to chase the dogs again. Uh, you know why? They didn't chase immediately. It's a, a group of young zebras, young, young stallions, young bucks. Hi, little puppies. And isn't this nice? They're going right down the road for a change. Now, if they're heading towards quarantine, I've just heard a report there could be a male lion around there. Uh, so, oh, all happening here. Should I check what Jamie's position is? Let's go around the termite mound. Ephraim's come to join us, and it's always better to have two of you following dogs. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, time for a scent mark by the looks of things. Now, scent marking will be done by the whole pack. So Jamie is apparently on central. Um, I think it might be a good idea. I'm just gonna let Final Tell tell Jamie to start heading towards quarantine. If the dogs are going that way. Uh, 
There we are. Okay, there we go. Hopefully they keep going in this direction. We don't want them to go that way, because that boundary is not too far away. We want them to head right towards the heart of Juma. Maybe go chase some Impala on quarantine where it's nice and open and easier for us to keep up with them. Although they are being quite kind by using Philemon's cut line. It's got a nice big wide road. So. I'm constantly checking up ahead to see if we spot potential prey, uh, a diker, an impala, anything that might uh, set the dogs off. And hopefully they're not disturbed by the irritation of a dwarf mongoose, uh, which I thought we were in for looked like quite a, a close, close run kill there till those mongoose started alarm calling. And then everything just ran as they looked up and saw a wild dog. There was, I think I could actually see the panic in the Impala's eyes. Isn't this weird? It's almost like we're part of the pack running parallel with them. I almost want to let out a woo call. Very good question from Romy in Ohio is wondering would the dogs take down a buffalo? Uh, three of them, oh, maybe with the drought, a young one that was in, in not in good nick, but in certain areas, uh, big packs will take out young buffalo, not an adult buffalo bull, but there is records of them in Botswana taking out uh, adult buffalo cows. No, don't go that way. Impala, Impala, running. Let's see if the dogs have seen it. I've seen it. One dog's seen it. The other's all sleeping. So I'm just going to try to jump ahead of them here, quickly on the corner where I got the opportunity to. Because if they go into this block uh, above Treehouse Waterhole, it is really difficult to stick with them. Let's see where they go. Hopefully they just cut across the top corner of this very thick area and keep heading towards quarantine. They might go down towards Treehouse Dam for a drink and a swim. There they go. So it looks like they're heading possibly down to Treehouse. I'm just going to find a spot where we can hopefully get ahead of them and let's see where they're going to go. Oh dear. Changing their mind. Now, Tube Jar is wondering, have lions ever chased or attacked African wild dogs? They are the biggest natural threat to, uh, to wild dogs, uh, and they do kill. Well, we're about to find out whether wild dogs hunt buffalo. Uh, I doubt three of them. I saw some buffalo up ahead. Now, with the drought and... They could try, check if there's a sub-adult or a young one. Now, I think it might be one of the first records in the Sabi Sands if we do see them successfully hunt a, a buffalo. Where are those buffalo now? The buffalo seen them. Yeah. They're running straight towards the buffalo. I think they're just gonna go past the buffalo, unfortunately. Let's try and get you a view of the dogs and the buffalo together. There we go. There we go. <laughs> A 
Okay, now they've, they've chosen a bit of a tricky area. Now they're still heading more or less northeast. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep with them up with them here. Okay, there they go. You can just see them there. Now this is why, you can see, it's not like a lion and leopard that just sort of walks, they, they really keep the speed up. Okay, while we keep up with the wild dogs, Jamie's got another surprise. What a fantastic way to return back to work with the dramatic skies and elephants in the background and of course this male lion. So thank you very much for those of you who let us know about this lion that was seen on the Juma Dam camera. Very much appreciated because of course now we're here with him and just I just want to be quiet for one moment. Maybe you can actually hear the impala alarm calling. They're coming through, Dave. It is. You can hear them. It almost sounds like somebody with violent sneeze attack. There you go. You might just be able to hear them. By the antelope, everybody in this area is aware of this massive male lion who is clearly unbelievably full. Look at that belly. It is truly impressive to see just how much these Birmingham boys have grown into their own. He actually almost looks as though something's hurting him a little bit on his face. But maybe it's just he's panting. It looks to me, in my brief assessment of him, it looks like Tinior to me. Tinior, or Birmingham boy number three, the one with the massive scar on his left cheek. Now, of course, we can only see his right cheek. And probably of all of the Birmingham boys, the one with the worst skin condition. Could be a fungus, probably a little bit of mange, most likely. But that looks to me like Tinio, one of the Birmingham boys that we actually regularly see. And his name means tooth, because you can see his canine on the other side, even when his mouth is closed, or through the scar in his lip. He's clearly just been for a drink. Apparently the elephants chased him away. And I noticed on my way through, rushing through into this area, they did so for a good reason. They do have a tiny little calf with them. I'm not sure if you managed to see it on the Juma Dam camera. There you go, there we go. Perfect, well done, Dave. Hello, little one. <laughs> well done, Dave. And this little one, only a couple of, I would say, a couple of weeks old. Still a little bit wobbly on its legs. Oh, stepping over the thorns. Gorgeous. And whilst it would be exceptionally unlikely for a lion out here to go for the go for an elephant calf, it is possible. It is very, very unusual though. Nevertheless, the elephants don't take any chances and they will be exceptionally protective of this little one. It's a little ba it's a little male. Possibly even the same age as the one that we saw when it was only about an hour old just a few weeks ago on these live safaris. That truly, hands down, is one of my most magical moments that I've had on Juma since I started working here over a year and a half ago. That little one, of course, was part of Fang's herd. I haven't seen any of the very, very distinctive members, so I think this is a different elephant herd, but I'm not 100% sure. Fang could be there, Fang with her backwards facing tusk, she could be around there. It's amazing how familiar we become with the different animal characters. I would love for that to be that little elephant calf that I saw when it was just stumbling around a few hours old. In the meantime though, Tinio looking thoroughly exhausted, panting away with his massive belly. And that's what I mean. There's, there would be, it would be so unlikely for a lion to risk trying to hunt an elephant at this point. It is a time of absolute plenty. I've driven past two buffalo carcasses already. 
one close to Buffelshook Dam, one that the Inkahumas hadn't even bothered to feed on. I eventually found it. There is just so much food for the predators at the moment. Definitely not worth taking on an angry elephant herd for a meal. And wherever he's come from, he's clearly eaten something. Now, Jennifer, you're looking at his bottom lip, and of course this is his, un, or usually his uninjured side. You're saying it looks as though he looks a little bit like it's sagging there, perhaps injured in some way. And I think it's just droopy from the heat. Uh, the male lions can get quite jowly as they start to get older. Um, like sort of certain large dogs, their, their jowls start to droop a little bit. But he was pulling a face earlier, you know that twitch? That, male, that lions get or any animal gets when they're slightly injured and they're uncomfortable and they're, so the muscles around their face, if they've got an injury on their face, the muscles around their face sort of constantly contract as a way of expressing their discomfort or trying to ease their discomfort. I don't think he's injured though. I think he's just a little bit droopy and some individuals of course do lose elasticity in their skin and you get some that are droopier than others. Right, apparently on this hot thirsty afternoon the wild dogs are having a drink. Well, like everything wild dogs do, they do it quickly. It was a quick slip and a, and a carry on. We managed to keep up with them through that thick block. We lost them once or twice, but now we are still with them and they're heading straight towards the Twin Dams Road. Mashoa now at Chilipan. Oh, oh, Impala. I've seen them. They're checking. Have they seen them? They haven't seen them. Come, I suppose I am being a little bit unfair. I am sitting probably a good meter and a half higher than them. Oh, and we're gonna get some, maybe some magic light creeping through. Oh, time for a scent mark. see them urinating and also pasting. There you go. Sniff sniff. <laughs> now one of the one of the really funny things is if you ever see a pack of wild dogs run past a hyena latrine, they always have to. They just can't help themselves. They have to scent mark on top of the hyena scent mark. What an absolutely spectacular evening. We've got dogs. We've got one of the most spectacular skies I've seen in quite some time. Look at that, isn't that? What? Oh, you don't get much better than this. What a welcome back to work. Now, which way, which way, left or right? <laughs> decisions, decisions. Two seem to be leaning left, one seems to be leaning right. Now, as I said, I'm hoping that they join up with the lower Sabi pack survivors. And Monique in London is wondering, would they join up or would they fight? It is impossible to say. It could go either way. But even if they did join up, there might be a bit of sorting out hierarchies. Well, it looks like... Oh, no, I don't think we have a definite decision on direction. North or south, north or south, or east. Looks like north it is. Uh, Darlene in New Hampshire said she's read that the vocalization of wild dogs is difficult for larger 
carnivores here, so particularly lions and that. I wouldn't say that, I've definitely seen lions react to the sound of wild dogs on a kill, but they definitely don't make as much noise uh, as certain other animals. So it's a very high pitched tittering, I suppose, is, is the best way to describe them on a kill. Oh, we might be going for another drink. We're about to approach Chele Pan now. So we will do our best to stay with them, but there's some tricky country up ahead. I love that behavior. So when you see wild dogs approach a, a bigger body of water, they're that one in particular was doing it, they are very nervous of crocodiles. They almost sort of try move to try test, see if there's any movement in a little bit bigger bit of water. <laughs> so nervous. Watching that water's edge. Don't think there are any crocodiles in Chelepan, but you never know. And if you're a wild dog, it pays to be cautious. I don't know, Brian, can you hear that little rah, 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 rah. That's that little grey tree frog or foam nest frog making noise? Very vocal tree frog. away from the water. Definitely one of the more nervous species. Oh, look at the reflection. Lovely. And it's a, a, my favorite dog of this pack with the white spots, the male. Oh, one of them, the two males and one female. Is it Ingala Breakaway Pack? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, Brian. Look at that. That's beautiful. Sorry, I was worrying about where they were going, but look at that exquisite reflection. Magic. Hey, Brian. We've had some good reflections in old Chele Pan, mm. Mr. Kunuma, and all some wild dogs. The. Uh, Matimba male lions. Okay, now we are going to have to move. They are getting into some potentially, potentially tough country. And I hear you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots as those dogs showed us their, oh, their, their reflection. Okay, hold on everyone. This is a tough little section. Fortunately, I know, a little sneaky shortcut through here. This is actually the area where we saw Karula take down uh, that dike alive. And if the elephants haven't added any extra obstacles, we'll be just dandy. There we go, back with them. There they go, down into the Moati River. As I said, we will be trying our best to stick with them. But this area across the river is pretty tough country. Holding 
going on. Whoop-a! Oh, they went the way. Oh, at least they're being reasonably kind. Oh. Oh dear, hold on. It looked like they saw something there. Ah, oh, they stopped running, thank goodness. Hi guys. We've just come from there. Where are we going back that way for? Now, I'm not 100% sure where the Inkahumas are. I know they're on... I think Ledwood Road. Okay. Now, strangely enough, one of the things I've seen wild dog kill the most outside of the obvious impala and stenborkies and things is scrub hares. Now, I'm wondering if this one hasn't smelt a scrub hare somewhere around here. Oh, yeah, don't go that way, please. Where's the front dog? Do you see the, the third dog, Brian? Yeah. Ah, okay. Good choice. Okay. We're just going to go back around on the road. We're not going to unnecessarily crash through there. Isn't this so exciting? What a great first day back. You see them, Brian? Right, there they are. So fast. Well, thank you, Valeria, who says if anyone can stay with the wild dogs, it's Brent. Uh, don't tell Steph. He, I think Steph has minor heart attacks every time I start following wild dogs through the bush. Oh, whoopsie. Okay. So they're heading through along Inyala Road South and it's quite a productive area for them to be hunting because you've got a lot of these little mud wallows and water holes uh, so there's always a good chance uh, you're going to get impala, kudu but the other thing is because you're right on the edge of the Nyala, Nyala Road South uh, river system you could get Nyala, you could get bushbuck uh, and some of the other species so it's a good area for them to be hunting and specifically at this time of the day. Now let's hope they keep going on the road. If they go off to the right, life becomes again quite challenging. I think they're gonna keep parallel. So this is what we call coursing. So they just keep running, running, running through the bush till they get something and they'll be able to chase it and take it down. I'm just gonna go forward ahead of them for a little bit. I just wanna uh, have a quick look. I'm sure they're gonna come through. I just wanna see if we can get up ahead and see if there's any potential prey species up ahead. It doesn't look like it so far, but I am. It's just, here they go, here they come, right at us. There they are. Hello puppies. At the moment the female definitely seems to be leading. Oh, 
that very distinctive wild dog smell. Here he goes. keep going. Now I know the lions are around that way. Um, let's hope the dogs go that way. Round the corner. Oh, it's a wild dog. I can't believe there's no Impala or Nyala here today. You can see that wonderful orange sky behind them as the sun sets. So again, I'm just gonna go up ahead of them and wait at the next road junction. Remember, hashtag Safari Live, um, or questions at wildearth.tv if you've got any questions for us. But while we jump ahead to go see what's cracking, let's go back to Jamie and uh, some kitty cats. <laughs> A very big kitty cat under very dramatic skies. Oh, and he's up and he's off. And I think he's actually thinking about calling. And I owe you all an apology. I told you I was rusty. This is definitely not Tinio. I was fooled by the skin condition that this particular lion has. This particular male. Now, I haven't worked out exactly who it is. I haven't had a good opportunity to really sit and look. But it's definitely not Tinio. Whoever he is, he is on the move. My suspicion is that it's Nsugu. But that's... The bald patches on his skin had me fooled for a second. Right, off we go. Male lion on the move, wild dogs on the move. What an exciting afternoon to be back in the bush. And a storm gathering, Dave. I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I think it's going to rain. But I'm... You know what I'm like with weather predictions. I probably shouldn't even try. I might even be jinxing it. Our male lion stopping to mark his territory. Oh. And moving on, on his way to quarantine. This is going to be spectacular. With the sunset and the open area that is quarantine, this is gonna be truly, truly beautiful. I'm going to hope that he's not going to lie down. I'm going to take a, take a chance and try and get ahead of him so we've, that we've got him on the clearing. So we're just gonna go round up, back onto the road. I think this should work. Sorry, just bear with me one moment. I've just got to update people on the game drive comms. Uh, stations, for those of you interested, the smell line is now on his way towards quarantine. That. Thank you. Okay, let's do this. Don't lie down. Well, I mean, you can lie down. Please do do whatever you want. I'm not actually saying don't lie down. I just think it might be very nice if we could get ahead of him as he walks. I see you. Oh, it's going to be such. It is such a spectacular evening. The atmosphere. This is for proper summer bush evening. This is what we were missing the whole of last year. This build up of heat and humidity, but it's in a nice way because you know that there's potential relief at the end of the day. The proper African summer. I'm hoping that might mean a proper African rainfall. Right next to the house that we live in, by the way. Where'd he go? I just saw him two seconds ago. Did he lie down? Oh, there he is. <laughs> yep, lay down. I suppose when your belly is that full, any walk is a bit of a mission. Here we 
we go. Stopping to pant. And that is a very typical movement for a male lion or any lion with a full belly. Up and walk a little bit, and then stop and relax again. You can see he's very, very warm. I wonder where he's been hiding. And I wonder if there is a female in the vicinity. We're still missing one of the Inkahuma lionesses. She's obviously not with him because there's no way he would have left her. Sure. Isn't that stunning? And maybe if we are very, very lucky, we might even get a chance to hear him call. And Fran, thank you so much for sending that through. It is wonderful to be back. And as you said, wild dogs, a Birmingham boy that we don't often get to see, and even a storm on the horizon. It's definitely building. You can feel it in the air. It's heavy, heavy. I'm hoping Dave is wrong. This is... I can't describe this atmosphere to you unless you've been and you've visited Africa before. Perhaps you come from an area where there are heavy thunderstorms. But there's nothing quite like the atmosphere that builds before a storm. There's a certain smell and it's as though the earth starts to exude its heat, giving up its heat. It gets very, very hot, almost oppressive, and everything goes dead still. There is not one breath of wind, and it seems as though the world is kind of holding its breath in anticipation before the storm breaks. I love this feeling, because when the storm does break, it is truly spectacular. And as a South African, I think and then one of the things I missed the most when I lived in the UK was the thunderstorms, a proper thunderstorm. And for the lions, of course, it means a good evening of hunting, if indeed they can be bothered. And I have to say, I'm not 100% sure that he is going to be doing any hunting anytime soon. I'm not sure what you think, but you never know. They are opportunistic, completely opportunistic animals. It's so good to be back. Hey boy, what do you think? So yes, thank you all for your welcome back. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be here. Dave, it's good to be back. Oh, it's good to have you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Suddenly incredibly oppressive heat. Did you feel that change? Come on storm. We need you and there's also something quite spectacular about watching lions in the rain as well and They always tend to be slightly more playful too. Although I doubt he's going to be playing but slightly more active definitely This drop in temperature I think comes as a massive relief to them. Marisha, I think so too. I see, I've been thinking it as well. I, I thought I'd made a mistake because his scar has healed up so nicely. But Marisha, I saw that half moon nick as well out of the top right of his ear. And while that's actually half the reason why I've been so distracted, as I've been listing the various nicks and scratches of the various Birmingham boys, and Tinior does have a half moon out of his ear. And his mane is not full enough for it to be in Sugu, and it's not full enough for it to be um, Nena the two older Birmingham boys, and he definitely, I mean, unless Mfumo did some incredible healing on his cheek while I was away, it's not him. I think it's Tinio. I've been desperately going through, running through the various nicks and scars of the Birmingham boys off the top of my head, but as I said, I'm a little bit rusty. I think it's Tinio. I need you to turn, mister. Would you, would you oblige me? Or maybe, perhaps not. How would you feel about that? It would be very convenient if you would. I think that scar on his lip has just healed up so much that it's no longer visible. Which is, of course, the danger of recognizing an animal by its scars. That's what happens. They heal. And they heal incredibly well. If it... Oh, hold on. He's seen something. 
I'm just going to switch my light off and change in his body language. What did you see, boy? Okay, he's relaxed a little bit again. And just that brief switch in the way that he was looking off into the distance. He's looking straight at the house that Brent and myself live in, at Inga's house, which is probably about 200 meters off to my right. I don't... S I don't see anything. <laughs> Sandra, you say you think that the only way that he will hunt is if a buffalo happened to just lie down next to him. I think that's a pretty valid, that is a pretty valid assumption, Sandra. That's hilarious. And um, we know just how incredibly fortunate the various predators have been during this drought. They have been, it's been such a time of plenty for them that he really doesn't need to bother himself too much. You never know though. Predators always do strange things, strange and unexpected things. The Birmingham boys were, when they first entered onto the scene from what I understand, were unbelievable and are unbelievable buffalo hunters. There was a time on Simbombili where they killed eight different buffalo in one go. But that was a whole buffalo herd and that was when all five of them were together. But eight different buffalo carcasses in one night. They didn't eat them all in the end. And if I remember correctly there were even lionesses scavenging off the, the leftovers while they could very secretively. So who knows what's in this Birmingham boy's head. I am hoping, I doubt he's going to hunt, but I am hoping that he decides to reconnect with the rest of his... Oh yes. You could be a shampoo advert, mister. Look at that, a, a, a hair product line with the wind blowing through his mane. Definitely some kind of brand of hair care product or perhaps a very good hair dryer. Tossing up what I want to do, I wanted to go on a little bit of a bumble, but I actually think I'm gonna play the patience game and wait for him to call. While I do, Brent has been frantically f trying to find the wild dogs. I don't think he's any had any success, but let's go and hear it from him. Oh, and they gave us the slip. But we did have such a great afternoon with them. We saw them get chased by buffalo. We saw them get chased by zebra. Uh, I lost them in a very steep little river system that we couldn't get through in the car. So by the time I came to this side, but I'm hoping they might have just gone towards Buffalo's Hook Dam. So that's what I'm going to do. I keep seeing wild dogs everywhere. Uh, but hopefully they have their general direction was heading towards the Buffalo quarter hole. So fingers crossed. And you never know, there could be a leopard lounging at the water hole. Probably not, though. Oh, hi, Aaron, in New Zealand. Now, Aaron would like to know, are the wild dog closely related to the other, or the first most endangered canid in Africa, which is the Ethiopian wolf, or the simian fox? Now, let's just hope there's a wild dog below us. There's not. We'll just wait here for a few minutes, see what happens. And while we discuss the Ethiopian wolf and the wild dog, hello hippopotami. So, here's the hippo. Now, the Ethiopian wolf is far more closely related uh, to a good old domestic dog. It's a canid, uh, and it shares its sort of genetic lineage um, with wolves. And so it is a canis and not a licon. So it is more closely related to, to, to dogs and wolves than it is to the African wild dog. Well, at least I had some rain while we were gone and greened up the place, put a bit of water about. Splendid. No wild dogs behind us, Brian? No. 
No. Okay, we'll carry on. Remember the hashtag Safari Live uh, or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to be like Aaron in New Zealand and ask us a question while we're on the live drive. Now, I think it's going to be a very interesting couple of months coming up now. Um, we are going to get some rain, but it's not uh, predicted to be flooding, which is what you see in Brian. I think, um, which is not not necessarily a bad thing. So if we had massive rains this year, a massive flooding, it actually would be quite bad for uh, a lot of the topsoil. So if we have normal rains, that's good. The elephants have done a good job clearing out some areas, smashing up the trees. The termites have then got in there and adding nutrients to the soil. So hopefully the grass, be the grass seeds that have been sitting dormant if we get a good, nice, even rain this year, we should get a really nice grass platform uh, and that should keep our general game numbers up. So you don't really want flood after, after a drought, you just want nice, even rains. Because otherwise, if you get too much rain too quickly, all that topsoil and those dormant grass seeds and stuff are often just washed away. And it can cause erosion and take a little bit longer for the bush to get better. Now. Now, of course, we, we are quite biased in how we want the bush to be, uh, but the bush can be however it chooses. And that's one thing we've got to remember. Uh, drought, flood, famine, feast, are uh, all part of the natural system. Hello, who's in the United Kingdom, is wondering, do I think animals can feel the change in pressure uh, when the rains and things come? Uh, I would definitely think that they're probably far more aware of it than we are. Uh, certain species in particular, uh, you, you can, uh, especially certain insects and frogs and reptiles, definitely able to uh, pick up that barometric change and uh, they, they behave differently accordingly. Now could be quite exciting to we could get some frogs I still think the frogs are probably not quite there yet we need a little bit more rain uh, we need sort of for the frogs to really sort of spark off you need those little mud wallows like we were we've been following the dogs going past uh, to get a little bit of vegetation growth there so somewhere for them to hide at the moment a lot of the frog species be quite vulnerable but what we're gonna do is we're gonna head down the straight road and there we go, Buffalo's a cut line, uh, to that area around uh, the northwestern corner, around the entrance gate, uh, and uh, where that leopard was seen crossing this morning. It's very possible that leopard's been lying up in the heat of the day, and now as it's getting a bit darker, uh, he or she might be on the move. So maybe we'll have some leopard luck in that area. Now, Brian, in my absence, has anyone seen a comedian? Yes. No! I spotted one, yes. Oh, darn it. Okay, so the chameleons are back. Um, okay, okay. Oh, so, one, only one? Uh, two. Two. Okay, well, hopefully we can add three, four, and five this evening. We'll have a, a good look for chameleons. As we go, I was, I was thinking, as I looked at the one branch, I thought I saw a chameleon there. I was like, oh, I wonder if anyone spotted one. Oh, Quran, red crested, just um, look at that, look at that camouflage, there we go, little female red crested Quran, oh, they are a stunning bird. And I heard you had a crazy sighting with three of them with Taylor this morning. Oh, magnificent colouring. Now, of course, they sleep on the ground, but they are very alert. I actually have seen a leopard catch one before. But it is quite difficult for a lot of animals to catch them. And we'll let her disappear, find her little 
spot to spend the night. Now, we're going to head up towards that northwestern corner looking for the leopard. Now, fingers crossed that that big burly Birmingham with Jamie decides to give you a show. And we've definitely had a fantastic first afternoon back and I'm hoping we can round it off with a spotted cat and perhaps a lion roar, which is what I think Brent has in mind, certainly what I have in mind. The moment though, this lion doesn't seem like he's got anything on his mind except perhaps a jolly good snooze, except there is a herd of wildebeest. Now you won't, I don't know that you'll be able <clears throat> to see them, maybe, you, oh you will. Well done Dave. There's a herd of wildebeest, oh an impala, racing around. The male's a little bit confused by all that's going on in terms of hormones with the pregnant females. So they're chasing each other around. And I don't think they've realized that this lion is here. And they're going to slowly but surely start making their way in this direction because of course this is where the waterhole is. And although he's full, as we spoke about earlier, there is always the chance that a, any predator is an opportunist, human beings included. And even with a full belly, he will absolutely think about hunting something. And perhaps if the wildebeest <laughs> came and lay down next to him, as we spoke about with the buffalo earlier, we could actually see some action. A male lion, his size, is more than capable of taking on a wildebeest on his own. And of course, they've got this terrible reputation, male lions, that they don't do any of the work. Oh, hold on. Let's have a closer look. Before we go into that, let's have a closer look in case he moves. Ouch! One of those things, the day-to-day -day injuries of these poor animals, their lives are incredibly rough and tumble. Now that could have been from a hunt or it could have been from a scrap with another lion. I don't know, it's impossible to tell. Not too deep though, and he's probably going, he will be absolutely fine. We've seen what kind of injuries these animals can heal up from. I'd love to see him full more and see how his face is looking. Dave, when last did you see him with his hole in his face? Mm, it's been a while. Though. It's been a while. I'd love to see him and see how that healing process is playing out. Cause I mean, when I left, it was already well on its way to healing. Okay. I wonder what I was talking about was the, the unfair reputation that these male lions have, that they kind of are just lazy slobs and they let the females do all the work, which is completely unfair, of course. Yes, if the females hunt and kill something, absolutely they will take the lion's share without bothering as to whether or not they've participated in the hunt at all. That being said, they are more than capable of hunting things themselves, and they do regularly. And, of course, they've still got the added energy expenditure of patrolling and marking a territory. And Donna Lee, you've raised a question that I've actually been thinking about as well, which is why are the lions hunting and not scavenging off at the dead buffalo that are all around? Is it their prey drive? Yes, it is their prey drive if the opportunity presents itself, which of course it has been, because essentially the Inkahumas and some of the Birmingham boys have basically been moving in about a kilometre radius around the, the waterholes the entire time. And the buffalo have to come and drink and therefore they have to encounter lions. So yes, I think the prey drive is very much a factor. As to why we haven't seen that many of them scavenging off the dead buffalo, I really don't know. I think it's just there's so much around that they actually... They're spoilt for choice, essentially. Why that buffalo at Buffalsook Dam hasn't been fed upon? It didn't even have vultures on it when I drove past earlier. It's just a massive dead buffalo with nothing feeding off it. And the only thing I can think of is, A, they haven't found it, so they haven't encountered it, or B, it just there's just so much to choose from. But you raise a very, very good point. Just before I went on leave, in fact, it was my last drive before I went on leave, I had found, we were doing rehearsals, and I'd found a dead buffalo on Gowrie, Maine. And the hyenas, our, and it was probably our hyena clan, although I don't know for certain, the hyenas had clearly been there. There were tracks absolutely everywhere around this thing, and it had kind of been fed upon, but they weren't there. They just left. This, this, this carcass still had half of its meat still on it, and they just left. 
they couldn't be bothered to be. I don't know if it was maybe fear of the lions, perhaps, that kept them from hanging around for too long. But it is absolutely fascinating to watch. As hard as it is for us with this drought and the way that it's impacted the animals, it has been fascinating to learn about the way that the animals behave and, and who benefits and who obviously loses out in the way that this all works. We knew, we predicted that the predators were going to have an incredible time. The animal, of course, that would have had the hardest, one of the, one of the animals that has had the hardest time of things is the hippo. Apparently he is out of the water grazing. I might, because I don't think this lion's going to go too far, I might go and have a quick look at the hippo before we lose too much light. We could go and have a look at the hippo and then come back to the lion. Apparently he's out and about. Let's go and have a look at him, because we don't always get presented with the opportunity to have a, a hippo out of water. And I can't see him from... Oh, nearly broke my microphone there. I can't see him from where we are, so let's go and have a look. Don't move too far. You can move, but don't move too far, please. It's always such a toss-up when I know that there's wildebeest coming down the side, but I really don't think he's going to go after them. He could not look more relaxed if he tried. So let's go and have a look at the hippo. I'm not sure whether any of you have seen the pictures talking about hippos and the, the struggle that they've faced. Obviously, the weaker they get, the easier a target they become for things like lions. And there are some incredible pictures circulating from the Kruger National Park of a lion hunt, lions hunting a hippo, and the hippo, and it just goes to show just how careful it's, the pictures are amazing, but it is a really important warning as to just how careful one needs to be in an area like this with wild animals. The hippo turns around and sinks its, its jaws into a Land Rover, I think it's a Land Rover, into somebody's private vehicle, one of the tourist vehicles. And it just gives you a really good idea or really good perspective of just how massive these creatures are. Because you can see his jaws have covered right onto the front part of the, of the vehicle. Dave, have you seen those pictures? It's incredible. I mean, shame. This poor hippo is obviously terrified and it's a good lesson for the people concerned. It could have gone... Probably wouldn't have gone too bad, but it could have potentially been very dangerous for them. But I'm sure those of you, perhaps those of you who have seen that article or have seen those pictures before, maybe you can post a link on some of the forums so that some of our other viewers who haven't perhaps seen it can have a look. It really is a very interesting perspective as to just how massive these creatures are and how we must never ever take them for granted. Shame, poor hippo. I don't know what the end result was. I think the end result was that the lions did actually catch and kill the hippo. There he is. I will always, personally, I myself am quite wary and at this time of year with the drought and in these conditions, are very, very careful when approaching an animal like a hippo, particularly one out of water, and just because they are unpredictable and they're stressed. And I don't want to add to his stress levels, so I'm going to give him plenty of room. See how he reacts. Hello, my boy. Now, Hunter, this gives us actually a brilliant opportunity to answer your question. Let me just get this light stable. You want to know how you tell if it's a boy or a girl hippo. Oh, shame. You can see he's also got a bad limp. We definitely don't want to get too close to this. Now, if we can zoom in a little bit between his back legs, you're looking at the only real way to tell. And in fact, Hunter, from what I can see in the gloom, this might actually not be a boy. This could actually be a female. So the only way to tell, because the males have um, internal testicles, like elephants, so one of the only ways to tell is to look between their legs and look for the penis sheath that hangs between them. And it's hard, or it's so hard in this gloomy light, I can't really see properly. My suspicion would have been that it was a male, just the fact that it was alone. You can also look at the shape of their head. The males tend to have slightly squarer, broader heads, but that's a risky 
it's a risky way of approaching things because, of course, you get young males, you get older females. The, the distinction isn't always, isn't always that clear. So if we have a look from a slightly different perspective, this must be, I'm sure this is a male. I just can't see the penis sheath properly. But have a look at the shape of his head and the broadness of it. They're one of the more difficult animals to tell the difference between a male and a female. But how cool is it that we've got these two different perspectives? Chomping away using that incredibly broad lip to essentially mow the lawn. And there you go. Looking at him from behind as he shuffles around and it's very, very clear. And I'm sure Steph has showed you the signs of the hippo feeding. Oh, Brent's got one of the little nocturnal creatures. Let's have a look. It's a baby bush baby. There were actually three of them looking out, and this is the bravest of them. So it's, well, not quite a baby, it's a, a youngster, a teenager. Look at that, isn't that just the cutest thing? Now, when I first spotted this, this is a new hole, there were four sets, six sets of eyes, and I thought, well, that looks quite strange. So this is a new hole, I didn't know about this one. Oh, where are you going? Hopefully you're coming back with a sibling or two. They're just waking up now. And they are just too sweet. There's massive eyes designed for spotting things at night. They're great insectivores. So they're great hunters. They also do eat uh, certain plant species fruits. Uh, but the South African Gallego, or lesser bush baby, which is this little guy, is a great lover of insects. So summer's here. Happy days for the bush babies. Come on. I'm waiting for the next one to sort of force its head out. Leopard, leopard right here. Oh, bush baby, there's a leopard calling on Gallagher's shortcut. Okay. Bye, little guy. Oh, there's another one. There's two, they're playing. Oh, torn between leopard and bush babies. Torn. Well, they've popped back down. Okay, let's go see if we can find that leopard. Isn't that awesome? I must remember this little spot. It's a good one. Wouldn't that just be too wonderful to find a leopard as well, Brian? Yeah. You know, just all the animals all the time. Killer bees are back. Okay, let's go. It sounded like on Gallagher's shortcut. So it could be Tingana. We've got uh, leopard audio. It sounds like on Gallagher shortcut, uh, about halfway between Buffalo's Hook and Vertel Access. So I'm pretty sure what that leopard calling is definitely the one that they saw crossing this morning. Exciting times. So while we try to catch up to where we thought we heard that leopard, let's go back to another big cat with Jamie. How exciting would it be if we managed to get a leopard as well? And we're actually going to try and help Brent out while we sit with this flat male lion, who so far doesn't show any signs of making any or any signs of making any sounds. We're actually close enough that we could probably hear the leopard calling that Brent has heard. So we're going to try and keep listening as we sit here and just wait and see if we can help him at least figure out exactly where that sound came from. Oh, what an absolute pleasure. I mean, Brent and myself didn't go far. We were in Hoodsprate for the entirety of our leave, but there's nothing quite like being properly in the bush. We did hear lions occasionally and hyenas and leopard but it's not quite the same as living in a reserve with them. He doesn't look like he's doing anything, hey, mister? It's 
thoroughly content. Now, for our newer viewers, for those of you who perhaps have just jumped on board, on board for the last few shows, you'll notice that we're very, very careful in our approach to lighting up animals. Now, if this were a diurnal animal, like those wildebeest, for example, that were behind me, I would not be using a spotlight in any way. But for nocturnal predators and nocturnal creatures, like the bush baby you saw with Brent, perhaps like the leopard you're going to see with Brent, see how optimistic that was, and with our lion, the reflective membrane of the, behind their eyes is so incredibly potent and adapted towards helping them see in the dark that we don't in any way affect them by shining spotlights on them. That being said, it's really important that we do it incredibly carefully and ethically. What you'll notice is I'm basically bouncing the spotlight off the ground. So I'm not shining it straight into his face. I could, but it's not really, that's not really polite in terms of how we do, you know, in terms of how we deal with the animals. So we try and avoid shining it directly at them. And what we'll do is we'll use the ground to bounce the light back up and just illuminate the lion as much as possible. Now that's the sort of thing that we'll do when we're following them behind then of course if they if he were to start hunting which i have to confess at the moment seems relatively unlikely but never say never but if he were to start hunting we would immediately turn off our spotlight and that of course is where the joy of infrared comes in you can see he's listening still whilst he does look fast asleep he's constantly alert and listening it is him you see it is him there you can see the scar on his lip it's just healed up so incredibly well that it was difficult to see at first. I really thought I was going crazy. I thought I was so rusty when I said it was tenure and then I couldn't see the scar. But I'm feeling a lot more comfortable in my initial assessment that it was still, was still correct. I had a moment of serious confusion there. It's a problem with being away for too long. But you can see he is still alert, still listening, his ears still working. Never fails to astound me the speed with which an animal like this can go from fast asleep or looking like it's fast asleep to up and moving. And we've seen it in so many different circumstances, from lions hunting to leopards running away from something or running towards a threat with Karula or Tundi, for example, in the baboons. Their senses are so much more refined than ours or at least their sense of hearing and smell. Not their sight, our sight is better, except at night. But I would really, I would love to be, we've spoken about this before, but I would love to be able to climb inside an animal's head for the day. I don't know how to describe exactly what I mean, but perhaps you'll understand. To be able to sort of experience the world as the animals do. Oh, look at that. You've got quite an impressive mane stretching down to your chest, mister. Amazing how much they've filled out. But yes, to be able to experience the way that they experience the world, I think would be absolutely fascinating. To be in a lion's head and to be able to smell like they can smell and hear the way they hear. Don't you think it would be absolutely incredible? It would be difficult to choose though which animal to to experience the mind of. Perhaps one day. It's amazing how much more and more we are learning about these animals and how much our understanding is deepening. He's not too bothered though. I'm quite happy to pant away. You know, you might even find, going back to the conversation about the buffalo, and that you might even find he was scavenging off a buffalo carcass. There's only so much that we see of these animals. The Inkahumas are a different story. We spend, we spend a great portion of their lives with them and experience what they are up to and what they're doing. But for the male lions, I don't know. I don't know when last you saw Tino. And apparently you have been seeing him relatively regularly, which is the same as when I left as well. Tino and Mfumo, the two of them together in this particular area. I wonder if Mfumo is with the youngest Inkuhuma female. I don't know. It's supposition. It's guesswork. I'm still f sort of refinding my feet back in the bush, working out where everybody is and where all the animals are. Come on, mister. 
Perhaps if he doesn't roar for us tonight, perhaps those of you watching the damn camera will get to be treated to the sound effects. I'm hoping if he does decide to roar tonight, he won't go too far away because my bed's probably about 250 meters away. So it'd be nice to hear that as my, on my first night back. Now, speaking of the sounds of the bush, Brent, of course, was trying to track down that leopard. Let's see how his search is going. So we sat and listened, we didn't hear anything, but from my guess, sorry, I'm going to blind the poor impala. Um, my guess is heading towards the Gallego pan, so that's what we're going to go do. Probably stand by there and wait for a little bit, hoping he's going to pop out. Come on, Tinganana. On a positive note, if we don't find him, we definitely got something to look for on the Sunrise Safari. So we're getting quite close to the waterhole now. He likes to take a route through the middle of a, this block here. Uh, when I say block, of course, I don't mean the concrete block. So what we, a block is a big patch of bush with no roads in it. And this is a particularly thick one. So we didn't try a venture in the dark into it. Uh, we tried to second guess rather where that leopard's going to pop up. Hunter. Well, Hunter is wondering how fast can a leopard run? Well, at its top speed, Hunter does 24 meters per second, which is just over 90 kilometers an hour. But it can't do it for very long. Uh, so normally they do those bursts for less than 20 meters. But it is a very fast animal when it wants to be. Now, Juma Dam Cam peeps, keep a lookout because he might not come to Gallagher, who knows, he might pop up at the Juma Dam. I'm just gonna sit here and listen for a second or two. Maybe the African night is broken with the rasping call of a male leopard. <laughs> Answer? Maybe not, but it's a very good chance he's going to pop up here. He could easily go the other way towards the, the Juma Dam. And uh, so a good chance for those of you who watch the dam camp, keep an eye out. I would have said when we heard him calling last, he was in, in this area just up here, in that dark patch there that Brian's showing you, <laughs> in the black. You can just make out the horizon. Now it's a good hunting night for leopards. There's a bit of a breeze, but it's this cloud cover uh, that is going to make it a bit easier for them to hunt. Hi Robin. Now, Robin B is wondering, will a male leopard scent mark on a regular route so you can basically work out where he's going? Sometimes. Sometimes they do like to take a specific route, other times they just scent mark as they go. Uh, generally, when there's a lot of scent marking, it's generally on a boundary with another male leopard. And uh, from our point of view, uh, Tangana's next boundary is actually quite far from here, it's up towards the Buffelshook boundary, and his next boundary is very far from here, uh, towards Anderson and uh, along, the, uh, along the drainage system in Arethusa. Come on, break the silence. Oh, get spotted by an impala. We'll take just as much as we'll take a I'll give it another 30 seconds. Quite a quiet night. You can just hear one confused starling. I've been sitting in the dark like this, uh, trying to listen for leopards or lions at times, and all of a sudden they sort of just appear out of the darkness next to you. Oh, whoops. And Tingan has done that to me right here. Let's do a quick glance with the spotlight. I think the route he might come through is 
literally through here. Okay, well let's move back up towards Canada shortcut. Maybe. He's changing his route for the evening. So while we keep searching for the glorious male leopard known as Tingana, let's go to one of the glorious Birmingham boys. <clears throat> uh, from the search for one big cat to an established big cat sighting, our Birmingham boy is still doing a very, very good impression of being fast asleep. He's not asleep though. Every now and again he does glance up, so he's not fast asleep, he's sort of doing what lions do best, which is catnapping, but I don't think he's really properly sleeping at all. It would be amazing to hear them vocalise, or hear him at least, vocalise properly. And then if he does start to call, then perhaps even we'll get an idea of where the other Birmingham boys are. I have heard rumours, but they haven't before we go too far into this, I have heard rumours, but I don't know exactly how confirmed they actually are. Goodness, summer insects coming back. But I've heard rumours of Junior being around Simbombili area, which would be absolutely incredible. Junior, of course, for our new viewers, is a lion, a young male lion that was with the Inc was part of the Inkuhuma pride. He was the offspring of the Inkuhuma females. And he did what male lions do when they reach sexual maturity, which is move off and disperse. And he's been around, every now and again, he's been around Manileti, Buffles Hook area. He's managed to form a coalition with another young male lion, and it's not yet confirmed which particular male lion that he, he has joined up with. But they have been seeing two young male lions, one slightly older, older, roughly Junior's age, and one slightly younger, roughly his coalition buddy's age, around Simbambili. Can you imagine if we had a chance to actually see Junior. It's not confirmed though. Uh, before we get too excited, I don't think, or at least it wasn't when I was last chatting to some of the other guides, I don't think that they've confirmed exactly which male lions. And there are lots, there are many young male lions moving about an area at any one point in time and it's impossible to keep track of them. Because a male lion, when he disperses away from his natal range, can move hundreds of kilometers at a time to search for a gap in territory. Either way, it would be very, very interesting. And I know that we'll be keeping a close eye and ear out for any signs of this a particular pair showing any signs of moving towards Juma. That would be very exciting. He, have to, he would have to be careful though, of course, especially with the Birmingham boys in this area. Okay, thank you so much. Speaking of sort of getting an idea of where the other Birmingham boys are, Jean sent through an answer. Thank you, Jean. Much appreciated. Um, you said apparently the last time we saw him four more was when he was mating with a Styx lioness. So presumably more towards the east, unless the Styx have moved a little bit, but probably more towards the east, more towards Cheetah Plains side. <coughs> and that apparently was around Sunday. So he could well still be occupied with that particular pastime which would explain his absence from Juma. It has been interesting, and of course it's not a, nothing set in stone, um, but it has been interesting watching the dynamics of the Birmingham boys unfold. And the way in which, and that it could change completely from one year to the next as they settle into being the dominant males. But the way that Mfumo and Tinyo always have seemed to be together, occasionally with Nena, the... Um, one of the sort of older Birmingham boys, he's been with them occasionally, and with Blo um, with Nsugu every now and again. But they do, it, it, they do seem to, Fumo and Tinyo seem to be the ones that spend the most time together. Or perhaps it's just because we've spent the most time with them. But certainly over recent months, on Juma, with the Inkuhumas, a lot of the Birmingham boy sightings have been Tinyo and Mfumo. Just listening for one second, I can hear guinea fowl. hope... There's always a chance that Tingana's decided to come down towards the Juma Pan. They're not alarm calling frantically enough though. So the sound I'm listening to is the sound of a bird, a guinea fowl, and they are calling off towards the waterhole. 
can just hear them in the background past the scops owl. I'm going to keep listening in case it does sound like they might be alarm calling at a leopard. In the meantime, let's go over to the man who is searching for said leopard. He is evading us. But don't worry, we haven't given up. I decided to have a quick look across quarantine to make sure my, my emergency alarm system was in. What was that, Brian? Uh, scrub here. No, 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 don't worry. Uh, that our alarm system is in place, and it definitely is. If that leopard pops up anywhere near here, there is a plethora of wildlife. Um, should we try a bit of infrared, show you how many animals there are? I'm going to give it a go. Okay, we're going to do this now. So we're going to see how many. So there's literally, there's probably, in my estimate, there's probably over 150 impala, there's zebra, there's wildebeest, there's waterbuck, and I almost thought I saw some buffalo in the distance as I flashed over quickly. Uh, all moving out into the open on this dark night, giving them a slightly better chance at seeing potential predators come their way. So, I mean, it is incredible. We're going to do a little loop here yeah, now, and so we've got the, the infrared all set up. Oh, spider webs everywhere. And just show you, oh, apparently the switch is not working. Yeah, I mean, so, right, so I mean, just do this quickly. I can't really see. But I mean, at literally at 180 degrees, there's just everything. If I go very quick, you just see animals, 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 all the way back. But let's, um, sorry about that, Brian. Uh, let's just keep going a little bit. Who knows, we're still searching for a chameleon, of course. Quite sad that there. Brian saw one without me, but I'll, I'll, I'll survive. And it is so nice to have all this greenery. Again, we haven't had any greenery. And uh, what looks like Brian might have fixed something up. There's still animals, 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 animals everywhere. Now, of course, I'm hoping Queen Karula comes back for a little visit. And uh, hopefully tomorrow, I'd love to see old Hasana and Shungira. See how much they've grown in the last 20 days or so. Oh, there we go. Now, I can see where Jamie is with the male lion down there. Close to Inga's house where we live. Pop that up in the sky, there's some impala in the road. God, just amazing how many animals are here with this green flash we've got at the moment. It is literally incredible. The amount of general game is fantastic. Now of course when you've got high numbers of general game, you've got high numbers of predators. Now, I did see some buffalo. Oh, Brian's got it. Let's see, Brian thinks we've got we've got it. Oops, no, not that, that's off. Okay, there we go. So we can start trying to show you some of the stuff in the dark now. There we go. So let's take that one off. Let's get a bit closer. We'll have to be a lot closer, apparently. There's a wildebeest in infrared. There's some wildebeest. There's some buffalo coming up in infrared. There we go. So some buffalo. And as I said, we just around the corner. There's probably 200 plus impala. We might get a glimpse of them in there. In the, and we can see some more wildebeest in the, in the, in the right at the edge of the light there. This is incredible how many animals are out on quarantine this evening. So we're just going to go around the next corner to where all the impala are stationed. And hopefully I don't crash because I can't see where I'm going. Driving in the dark here. Oh, there we go. Let's get, let's get to them. So uh, from uh, the killer bees, it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm sure I look quite scary. Do I look scary, Brian? You look scary. I look scary. I like... Uh, but um, here we go. Here are the impala. Enough of me looking like an idiot. 
There's the edge of the Impala here. So it must be 150 to 200 Impala spread around quarantine this evening. So, and there's some water buck as well there. So just so many different species. But uh, from Brian and myself, uh, it's been great having you with us. And there comes an infrared thumb. <laughs> um, and we look forward to being with you on the sunrise safari, bright and early. It's great to be back. Thanks very much for all the congratulations. But back to the mail line for the last little bit of the show. Oof, to you too, Wildebeest. And really, I cannot think of a better way to spend one's first afternoon back in the bush than with some of Africa's most iconic predators. And what a truly special afternoon it has been. And whilst Etinior shows no sound of giving us any roars or any, any kind of a show, and indeed really doesn't seem like he's going to be up to terribly much any time soon, it has been an absolute pleasure to reunite with them once again. I'm looking forward to this evening going to bed, hopefully, with the sounds of lions roaring. But keep an eye on the Juma Dam camera, because who knows, the leopard that Brent has been looking for might well pop out to have a drink there. You might hear the lions calling. In fact, I think there's a very good chance that you could hear the lions calling at some point tonight. Now, all in all, spectacular things to look forward to. And then, of course, with eager anticipation, we look forward to tomorrow morning's sunrise safari to find out what has unfolded during the night. I'm so, I'm so looking forward to just bumbling out and about and maybe going to Cheetah Plains, or maybe to Arethusa. Lots of things to look forward to. But this is a perfect way to be welcomed back into the bush. Thank you, mister. Very much appreciated. <laughs> With your very full belly. And so, on that note, it is a time for us to say goodbye. We've reached the end of the Sunset Safari and whilst felt like a flash. So, a big thank you to David for his fantastic camera work, as always, and his wonderful company. It's nice to be back, Dave. As well as to, uh, I think it's Kirsty and Lou in Final Control. It is Kirsty and Lou. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you joining us from across the world, sending through your questions and your comments. And thank you again for all of your support and your incredible congratulations and welcome back. I'll catch up with you on the Sunrise Safari. Until then, bye-bye and have a wonderful...